Can you come down? So you are sitting so far. Yes. Thank you, sir. He's our host, so if you don't uh, show some respect, you can throw us and talk to You are working as a man. Goodbye. You are working as. You are working at the camera, sir. So where do you want me to start? Yes. <laughs> you were calling me there. No, you were no, calling no, no, me. No, no, no. We are not calling you. You better find company. Yes, you can, sir. Yes. The opening address will be given by Dr. Kole Shetima uh, because this film has been made possible and what we're doing today has been made possible by Makato Foundation and Clark. And uh, we'd like to hear from Dr. Kole Shetima, who is the Executive Director of Makato Foundation. He will join us by this film. We know how COVID has exposed some of the structural challenges our country faces, especially around the health crisis, the lack of access to basic health services in our society, the inequalities that are there in our society. I'm hoping that this crisis that COVID has exposed us to is also going to be an opportunity for us to see how do we respond to this opportunity that has been created. And certainly the idea of a collaboration between the public and private sector is something that I think one of the most important uh, discussions that we should have because there's a lot of ways in which the private sector can bring about uh, improvement in our health care and the government can also provide the uh, necessary environment for this to happen. And that's why I'm very excited that there is going to be a panel conversation about the role of the private sector and public sector in improving health care for our people. So let's see this COVID crisis that we are in as an opportunity for us to improve on the quality of life of our citizens, to make healthcare more accessible, more available, especially for poor people who are not with us, but people who are people, poor people who are not be able to have access because of their rural condition and other things. Uh, and I'm hoping that, that also the urban poor who also have a major challenge of having access to healthcare. But I think that COVID also has shown that that even if you are rich, and however rich you are, you may not be actually be able to escape it by saying that you can easily travel out of the country and get a better health care. No. Many countries at that point uh, essentially barricaded their borders and therefore made it impossible for people to travel, or even if they had the resources to travel. What we're thinking about is how do we make it possible for all citizens of Nigeria to have access to basic health services? and to ensure that this service is available to each and every one of us. I'm very excited and very glad that with our token support to Daria Media, what meant for other things, but to turn it around and use it for this purpose. As a foundation, we are always very flexible. Whenever we see an opportunity to improve the work that our grantees are doing, we are always very happy and very excited to be able to do that. And that was why, although the grant to Daria Media was not primarily about COVID, but when this, this situation happened, we thought that, that as good uh, philanthropic organization, the least we can do is to enable our grantees to respond to the pandemic, to use whatever resources that they have so that they can help our society, they can help our community. And that is why we're very excited that uh, uh, Daria Media uh, sought our support to use our resources, even if it was not meant for that, in order to uh, draw attention so many ways and max a number of challenges that we are facing as a criminal country. And I hope that this conversation and more other kinds of conversation will lead to bringing about solutions to our healthcare challenges in the country so that each and every Nigerian citizen, wherever they live, will have access to basic healthcare services in our country. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Oh. Thank you very much. I thought the applause would be louder. So you can hear in Abuja.
very big out Dr. Kole Shetima. And having listened to him, now we know why the film was produced. The film is not just about COVID, it is still a conversation. And the film, after watching the film, we're going to have this conversation. I applaud the uh, guests in the house. Please do not leave after the film, because the conversation is actually why we're here, aside from the premiere of the film. And those who are going to lead the discussion uh, in that uh, Professor Issa Sadiq Abubakar, who is the director of Center for on COVID-19 Research Group. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. The Deputy Secretary for the Health Coordinator, Kano State. Thank you very much. And in that same day, you Um, see if we can look at all the things that COVID has exposed about the things we're getting wrong, the things we're getting right, and how to just make sure that we get things right and focus on building a society that we can all really be proud of. And then if that happens, if COVID has become that catalyst that allows us to self-reflect and from those reflections learn lessons, then the life of people like um, Uncle Gali and all those who've died from COVID will not have been in vain.
Your last party. My last party. My brother, my mother, it was everything to me. Good. You know that. It was everything to us, my mom. You didn't look after all of us. You looked mm-hmm. after us, all of us. You did. Look, you are good. You are good. You are good. I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. i The virus is first reported in Wuhan, China on the 31st of December 2019. On the 11th of January, China reports its first death. 21st January 2020, the World Health Organization Western Pacific Office confirms the disease is also being transmitted between humans. 22nd January 2020, Nigeria's Center for Disease Control, NCDC boss, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazu, issues an official public health advisory statement alerting Nigerians while calling the threat to the country moderate. 30th January 2020, for the sixth time since it was established, the World Health Organization declares a public health emergency of international concern a designation reserved for extraordinary events that threaten to spread internationally. The question beating in many hearts at this point is, how prepared are we? In late January, I was actually invited by the World Health Organization to be part of a mission to go to China to understand what was going on there. By then, we already had a significant outbreak in China. And that mission was so eye-opening and terrifying in terms of the prospects uh, for the world. Seeing Beijing the way we saw it in February was almost unimaginable. You know, there was nobody on the streets. You know, absolutely no one. So we went to three cities in China including Wuhan. A small part of the team actually went to Wuhan. And two things I could not forget. In fact, three. 
One was the one that has been full of people. Um, secondly, was that every single person I did see was wearing a mask. So the, the level of compliance in a society that was faced with this challenge um, in a big country like China w was incredible. And then finally, it was about the response. Um, you know, I looked at the infrastructure that they had built up. You know, given that I've been in this work for quite a while, um, China did not have a, a CDC uh, before SARS, uh, the last big, one of the last big outbreaks. And post SARS, they built up this big China CDC uh, with branches all over the country. And I could see how you could activate a public health architecture to respond to an outbreak in a way, I was worried immediately that we, we did it in time. Yes, uh, we're in a very rudimentary stage of our development. So I think it was at that point that I really realized how big a challenge we, we could potentially be facing. Nigeria held its breath with Lagos State, where the nation's key entry points are located doing its best to prepare for the inevitable. Every evening when Abayomi calls me, I'll be like, has it happened? I mean, that happened for like, for like a week. So, so it, was, it, it was a mixed feeling. Do you understand? I mean, when you, when you know that this thing that is waving around, it will eventually come. So it was more of, if it appears, how ready are we and how are we going to contain it? Um, the moment it started on Southeast Asia, we knew we were in trouble. Um, so we ramped up our biosecurity plan. We've been slowly planning, you know, WHO said expect something. Uh, there are a group of scientists around the world that talk about global bias, uh, biological um, existential threats. And they've warned that any time from now we're going to see something big. You know, WHO calls it Agent X. X meaning you don't know what it is. It's a novel pathogen. So we knew that COVID-19 was Agent X. Lagos said has set up an incident command system because we knew that it was a question of when and not uh, if. if. Yes, we you knew said that. that. Yes, yes we, knew, we, knew, yeah. we, knew, we knew that. So we have set up that and then we started renovation on this building. In late February 2020, as worldwide cases surpass 83,000 with at least 2,800 deaths, it happens. COVID-19 lands in Nigeria. We're actually, uh, we're, we're waiting, literally we're waiting. You know, so by end of January, we had put up the small facility you know, we've looked at our bio bank, we've looked at a few other, I mean, uh, epidemiological things that we need to have in place. You know, so it was just like a waiting game, mm. that when is it going to happen? But unfortunately, we're all looking for a Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> you well, I mean... Because that's yeah. prevalent. So we never knew that the person was because going to come from Europe. Europe. So when it actually happened on February 20th. If you think back to the first case, um, from Lagos to uh, Ogun State, and you know, you remember we, we found all the contacts, we isolated them, we found the one case among the... It was a very good public health response. And for, for a while, we thought, we've got this, you know. You must, for every patient that is infected, you must trace all the contacts and somebody must get in contact with them daily. There's an arm of the, or a pillar, an arm of the emergency operations center that is called uh, epidemiology and surveillance. And they have a large number of, of people. So they have to deploy their staff to, one, trace uh, all the people that were in the flight with him. 
they have to trace those that uh, the driver and the protocol that met him at the airport and drove him to the hotel. The people that he met at the hotel, the receptionists, people that he interacted with at the hotel, everybody was followed up. The driver that took him to Ogun State, they were all followed up. And then the people he also interacted with within the premises of, of the compound. And I tell you one of the strongest shortcomings we have is data. What do I mean? So when somebody comes in, just arriving, and he said they should fill the form, and they just hurriedly fill the form in one minute or two minutes, there's no way you could confirm that those addresses were genuine. You, you understand? So data now became an issue for us when we started the contact tracing. Because we now realize that somebody had given an address that really doesn't exist. But I was now wondering that if we had a, a, a prior data. You know, somebody in America, maybe that's why they were so, they were so confident. Mm. A, secure, a social security number is social, they will track you in, in no time. You're a unique identity. Uh, prepared a couple of labs in Nigeria to be able palliatives to support the growth of the manufacturing, the SMEs, as well as the agricultural sector. While the response to the index case is a good public health response... Uh, fairly aggressive, actually, in closing our airports. Of course, we would have won a bit. It really more difficult. But remember, people kept coming even when the airports were closed because there were always exceptions and exceptions primarily for Nigerians because they have a right to their country. You know, hindsight is a great thing, but at that time, we had no understanding of the level of asymptomatic transmission that happened. Uh, so even all the things we were doing. On the 24th of March, 2020, Lagos State issued an alert confirming that one of the people who tested positive for the COVID virus On the 30th of March 2020, President Muhammad Buhari makes a national broadcast and finally announces a 14-day lockdown of Lagos, neighboring Ogun State and Nigeria's capital Abuja starting from 11 p.m. A nation known for its ever-busy streets and markets, its boisterous parties, gatherings and colorful people went quiet leaving emptiness despair and fear there was a very eerie feeling of uncertainty because the world as we knew it began to change before our very eyes. It's a by the environment. You, you don't have the support of people that you normally would if that happens because there's social distancing, there's a lockdown in the town, so people can't even visit you, even though that also has its good part. But the toughest part is I have two of my siblings who live abroad. And um, even though my dad has always told us that um, we must bury him within a week. So we all knew that. My mom died 19 years ago, and we buried her within a week. And he always reminded us that he wants ex It is a ghetto. It houses the poorest of the poor.
Come the night, if we pursue, I will start to run. I have to wound with my bikini that day. Um, day before yesterday, but it's not good ideas now. They don't tell everybody to beg her for this Nigeria, for this legal self, or for this country. Now for you go now, two leg, strike on this place. Because you make a chunk food. This initiative is about meeting people's need. People are hungry. And it was funded by almost everybody, all the stakeholders, people from abroad, the London, the US, people from the Lekki Estate, outside Oniru, everybody from 500 Naira to 200 Naira to as much as a million Naira, everybody has donated and funded it. A lot of people, more than a hundred people. People have to make money to feed their families. And when it comes to hunger, COVID-19 looks set to take the back seat. I'm in Ladikwa International Spare Parts Market, also known as Ladikwa Market in Lagos. This is the place that essentially enables Nigeria to move. Because as you well know, most people cannot afford new cars. And so this is where they come to buy the parts that they need to get their vehicles moving. Cars moving. When the lockdown was announced, there was a huge loss here because people had to shut down completely. Now the government has decided to allow the market to open at least three times a week. So it's open on Monday, on Wednesday, and on Friday. And it is business as usual. I didn't see any evidence of social distancing, and a lot of people are going around without masks. When it comes to COVID-19, in the whole of Nigeria, some people still do not believe that it exists. That is that the case in the market? It's a new crisis, which is an economic crisis. And then there's a third leg, which is the issue of security. So in balancing an outbreak, you have to have all those three legs balanced to keep your community stable. Inside we have rice. 10 kg of rice, 10 kg of gari, 10 kg of uh, beans, there's uh, vegetable oil and salt. It's from the federal government victim support fund. Okay, so who will help me? Two of you. I understand you had issues at the beginning of the lockdown. And they need a delivery company all over the world. What should we do? We can't disappoint our customers. We can't. People are relying on us. And a lot of farmers, when they grow these things, they are relying on hotels and restaurants and all that to buy bulk. And we also buy. So they are stuck with food. Then also they are stuck with their staff not being on the field. Then transportation, there's no transportation for them to move. So you have gloats everywhere. So we have a lot of our farmers not being able to supply us. Then even in Mount World, we had issues there as well. So, of course, you know the agri value chain is not even well developed as well. We only have storage for greens. We don't have storage for vegetables. There's no cold chain anywhere. There's no pack house anywhere around the country. You know, the, if there's any, just few. So now, is it, uh, uh, this was the time that it showed that we were all the structures, the infrastructure. Interacting with so many people around that time, and COVID was already in Abuja, uh, made me begin to feel, I, I, I had headaches and felt uh, uh, like I had fever. Uh, uh, but when I came and I complained to 
Uh, my doctor, they said, look, you know, you need to rest. You've been overworking yourself. It's stress. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Uh, and uh, uh, I called the Commissioner of Health. I said, I want to be tested. Uh, very well. So it was important to make that disclosure and to assure them that the state will run and this is the person in charge. Uh, secondly, I also thought it was important uh, for people to know that this disease is real and not to be in denial. I've got it. I'm the number one citizen of the state. I also happen to be the number one victim of COVID. COVID-19 was referred to as the disease of the elites in media reports and started off with very few labs right from the beginning. In fact, at the beginning, we had zero labs testing for COVID, just like any other country. By mid-April, we had um, about um, 12 laboratories uh, covering eight states. We now have 51 laboratories um, throughout the country with a capacity of about 10,000, up to 10,000 tests a day. But then we only do about 2,000 or so per day. Um, but there, there are many who argue actually that given the size of our population, those numbers do not actually represent a significant um, testing capacity. No, they don't. Uh, they don't. Uh, we are definitely under testing. Now, why are we not testing? Uh, the A series of reasons for that. One is the ability of the right people. Um, logistically, uh, there are special tools to collect samples, nasopharyngeal swabs, something we call the virus transport media, because you have to put what you collect in a preservative uh, to enable the virus to be viable when it gets to the lab. So there's all of that that needs to be distributed adequately around the country. There's and we the, don't produce any of that. We don't locally. produce any. We import all of this. The one thing we do produce is the virus transport media. It's produced at NVRI in JOST, the Nigeria Veterinary Research Institute, which is actually a great example. Um, then, secondly, there's the stigmatization around the disease. Up till now, people are still hesitant to test, even when they are symptomatic. You know, I saw that, you know, it's hard. You see doctors have treated some of two rounds of malaria uh, medication. The patient is dysnic uh, in respiratory through communication to say, listen, uh, this can save your life and uh, keep you there. diagnose, you know, and then to be able to store and then to be able to do research. Uh, these, are, these pathogens are, are very, very dangerous. You know, they're called pathogens of high consequence. And you need a very special environment in which to manipulate, to manage them, to process them and to make your diagnosis. So we built what we call a biosafety level three uh, laboratory with a biobank. And we've been building that since 2016, and we commissioned it in 2018. And it's inside this facility in Yaba. If we could test 20 million Lagosians, we would. But nobody has the budget for that. So we have to test strategically and try and understand what the virus is doing in community and then use that to extrapolate our strategies. to 30 bed infectious diseases what drug resistant TB which is one of the things we treat here so now we will configure it um, to suit our um,
Did you put them all? It was a setup. That you 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 encourage that to happen, and then you don't want the public to know. That's not the way to go about it. You. Nigeria's oldest university teaching hospital. At the time it was launched, I think in the 50s, 56, it had cost something like 4.5 million pounds to build, the equivalent of something like 27, 28 uh, billion naira. And it was state of the art, comparable to any in the world, and for a very long time was a center of excellence in the Commonwealth, not just you know, in Africa, but across the Commonwealth, competing with hospitals in the UK. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the trajectory of this grand place has remained consistent, or have we seen a decay? I think looking around, you know there's been a decay. We've always had the problem of maintenance in Nigeria, and uh, the government should begin to look, and that's what we're seeing. Usage, I mean, this is a very grand yeah, structure, fantastic you know, we structure look all over, everywhere, different ways. I mean, we have learned this lesson at a high cost in the past few months, and we must ensure that the lessons learned are reflected. 2021, even though the fiscal space is very tight, but I hope in 2021 the health budget would really reflect the importance of health uh, when it comes to uh, national development. Um, it's, it's very likely that what we would see is additional prioritization of health over the next few years. Within the COVID budget itself, we've already made accommodation to, to build um, isolation and treatment uh, facilities, 45, 43, 45 bed facilities in every state, one per state in a federal teaching hospital or federal medical center. You don't really build what you need to fight a war during the war. You, you, it's inefficient. You don't give it the diligence it requires. And so we're going to go back. But going back to the first point is, we have to invest in these in peacetime. And it, it means that we need the National Assembly to appropriate the funds even after the outbreak, and not to think, okay, the outbreak is over, let's go back to business as usual. Because it's only what we lab. So what they needed to do was switch the testing from one type of disease to another. But we had to build up the lab infrastructure. So at the beginning, even if they offered us reagents and all, we didn't have the labs and the human resources the skilled expertise to absorb the support that we needed uh, to save the country. The annual salary of one member of the House of Representatives, approximately 17 million naira, can pay at least 10 entry-level doctors. And that's not all. A senator's salary is of at least 14 entry-level doctors. The refurbishment bill for the National Assembly is now 115 billion. That is um, three times the budget of the Ministry of Science and Technology. Almost five times, I think, uh, twice Ministry of Education, um, et cetera, et cetera. And people are saying, how can you in all consciousness appropriate to yourself that sort of money at a time when limited resources and urgent needs in the health sector? I think it's important to do a comparative analysis of the budget or underdeveloped, ill-developed, um, underdeveloped, developing, and developed legislatures. What is their budget? What if I tell you that today in the National Assembly, we're using the most archaic, that's why we don't have electronic system in the National Assembly. You can't even find the, find the parts anymore. You can't find the parts. When we wrote to those who, who manufactured, they, should, they were shocked that Nigeria still has this thing that was developed 40, 50 years ago, that people have way, even in Africa, have gone way beyond that. That costs money. Nigeria is perhaps the biggest country in Africa, and we show off for it. How do you explain that your legislature does not have a library? The same way you explain that schools hold don't have running water hold and on hospitals on. don't have toilets. Hold, hold on a second, hold on a second. When you talk about the National Assembly, you're not talking about members sitting down there and you say 115 billion. That's another 
mis, mis, uh, misconception. The National Assembly includes the public complaints commission, includes the uh, in, uh, Institute of Legislative Studies, includes National Assembly Service Commission, includes several departments, includes the AIDS, includes so many other areas. It's not just 360 members in the House and 109 senators. No, that's not it. It's a, it's a misconception. It does us a great disservice uh, when you, 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 you when you single out the National Assembly and you look at 115 billion. If you divvy up 115 billion amongst everything I've told you, you see that it comes to pittance. Think about the human resource side of healthcare. It's not always about infrastructure and it's not always about ventilators. It's actually about the human beings that will bring it all together. Our thought, thought process was that if these people can't take care of themselves, if they can't provide for their families, um, how dedicated can they possibly be to the task ahead, given that they're risking their lives? And then you, we then realized that um, even those that um, were in the for, uh, forefront of the fight against COVID were not being paid hazard allowance. I was aghast when I found out that we weren't being paid health hazard, uh, health hazard uh, or that doctors were not being paid, paid their allowances. Hazard allowances, and um, I have pursued that vigorously with all the might in me. And as a matter of fact, the last budget, uh, the last budget, I, I, I made it clear to to members that uh, this we're not going to pass this budget until I see the health as uh, the hazard allowance in the budget, because it wasn't in the budget, and we put it we put it in the budget, and I guess maybe it was an oversight, uh, and was ratified by the by Mr. President. So yes, it's. Um, Again, it's getting our priorities right. You know, where there's, um, where the, you cannot have a country, an unhealthy country. So health is most probably one of the most important sectors in any, in any economy. With the nation in the grip of a looming pandemic, Nigeria's House of Representatives when great individuals come together to value certain parts of society and build them up. Nigeria has never been lacking in resources or even in the human energy and the desire to succeed. Um, to a large extent, we've been distracted by uh, easier ways. Uh, the best example uh, is to think of what happened when very brilliant engineers come out of university. Um, they end up working in oil companies. So they're not working in manufacturing, they're not working um, in building the fabric for industrialization for this country. They're not doing that. And that is because they get paid in much, uh, they get a better, a better package in the oil industry. That is not the best place to put your best resources. Uh, and we see the same thing happen with financial services when people come out of school with degrees in medicine or engineering and they end up working for a financial institution. That level of financialization, which draws resources from the core of uh, the economy is very damaging long term. But as a country, we have always known that oil has been a distraction for us. Oil has prevented us from investing in the infrastructure that we need to invest in. But also oil has subsidized imported consumption. And for as long as we had enough oil flow to subsidize our imported consumption, what tended to happen was that we killed the local production capacity. The human capital starts from when you're conceived in the uterus, in the womb. So right from the moment you're born till you're about five years old, the state has to ensure good education. That together gives you what we call human capital. And with human capital, you can drive your economy. So we've got to focus on health and education and make sure that we have the next generation of people that can compete to drive the state and the national economy. If we fall back on that, then we'll forever be behind the curve of global welfare and global competitiveness. The human resource has to be now be at the center of everything else, and that has to be the starting point. As to, as, as to what the state should do, 
I think we have locked the state into a space where they are not able to compete against each other because the policies that will lead to competition are centrally defined. I think that we should allow freedom for the state to set their economic environment. If you've seen where, within the limited um, power that the states have, those that have set the right economic environment have seen an inflow of capital and an inflow of people. If we expand that power, what would happen is people will experiment with different models. There are some that would think that you know they don't want to be um, business friendly, and there are those that want to be business friendly. But give it four years, the result will show. I feel um, the rot, but it also revealed the opportunity. So there were things that we thought was impossible before that suddenly has become the norm. We are now found ourselves building um, hospitals and isolation centers in weeks, in days. It may not be the 1,000 bed hospital that was built in Wuhan, but we've seen Nigeria using local resources put in place usable hospital facilities in weeks. Uh, we've seen young people come up with ideas that can translate into building ventilators um, locally produced. Um, we've also seen the government intervening in the healthcare sector. We have argued for healthcare for about five years now, um, and suddenly we have a huge fund approved by the central bank for the purpose of healthcare. So it has sort of freed us also from the illusion that we can continue to import everything and be okay. It has freed us from the idea that the hard work of rebuilding our healthcare system was something we could do without. And we could just simply ship our sick uh, um, parents to, to India or, or to the United Kingdom. That, 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 that reality has dawned on us. We have enough talents in this country to do what we want to do for us, to solve our problem. I, say, I used to say one thing, we have all it takes to solve our problem, but we will not take all we have. And that's where our problem is. If we can get more people, I think you described, becomes easy to deal with. Uh, in two ways, obviously, if you people are employed and they have a gainful, um, they have an income that is reasonable, then they start to provide some of these things for themselves, even before government intervenes. The second point is that when more people are um, employed and they're able to pay taxes, then it's easier to hold government accountable to also provide um, facilities and social infrastructure. So the focus has to be how do we get people employed. One of the reasons why a lot of our people are unemployed is that we continue to export jobs. And the way we export jobs are that we consume things that are produced elsewhere. And for everything that is produced somewhere else that you consume, the labor component of that is out there, not in here. Um, we also continue to actually physically um, uh, import labor uh, because the skill sets that are required and the educational system that has failed over time has meant that you actually cannot deliver output if you, if you don't bring in labor from abroad. And this could be something as complex as bringing in um, technologies to come and help you set up a factory, or from there would now be used to expand the social register and to begin to get more resources to the bottom of the pyramid. Because we need to keep supporting them pending when the economy is robust enough to offer them jobs. We cannot afford to stop supporting the poorest people. And I think that that's what should that be. Why does that matter? Why does the... F From a purely selfish perspective is that um, you don't want people in your society who have nothing to lose. Uh, but from a broader perspective, from, if I look at it from the perspective of the economy, there are resources, human resources. These people, when you apply them properly to capital and to, res to land resources, you create output. So prosperity is actually the result of getting these people into the productive process. For Nigerians to do what we need to do collectively, it means that there has to be um, a sense of trust between the government and the people. Uh, for me, when I look back on, on the time, I say, uh, I owe this country much more than I can ever pay back. But the, the generation can't say that. The problems we do not solve today, when we have the opportunity or we're in a position to, the same troubles will bite us tomorrow. Who do you call your hero? Who do you manage to do plea bargaining, spend six months in prison, the next day is a chief in his town? There's a the convoy things. welcoming Yeah, and then the whole town comes out beating and drumming. So that's what I'm saying. But the more you steal, the better you become in the country. 
when it's still the people that use the word attitude. If one of us oppose that thing and say, no, we're not going to allow that kind of thing, that, that type of situation, you know, then, you know. It's out. Yeah. Because often when we talk about the problems of Nigeria, there's always a focus on government. And yeah. I mean, rightfully so. Yeah, it's not exactly. as if government doesn't mm, have responsibility. Mm. But you're saying citizens also have oh, well, responsibility. We have a role. I mean, we get the government that we deserve, as the people say, because we allow them. Globally, uh, there is conversation that is going on about the failure of capitalism as currently constituted. And in fact, even though we're doing very badly, um, the truth is the countries that traditionally we looked up to, the United States, the, the UK, the European countries, many of them are in trouble. And, and the general the belief is that actually this ideology that, we, that we've been pursuing, where we believe the market will take care of everything, is actually to blame because there is more inequality today in the world than there has ever been. The gap between the rich and the poor is getting wider. A tiny percentage of people globally control the wealth of the world. And so if even places that are sort of more far advanced than us are sort of grappling with these issues and questioning whether that is, you know, what they've done, the policies they've pursued are the right way, why should we sort of go through their journey? Why are we looking to follow those footsteps when we could be rethinking things uh, that are sort of maybe slightly different. The capitalist system came up with a system for bringing resources together. I don't think that system has failed. I don't think the market system has failed. I think governance has failed. I think irrespective of what you practice, if the governance doesn't exist, it will fail. I, think, I don't think religion has failed. I think the governance of religion has failed, and that's why we have extremism. Uh, it's not because religion itself has broken. I don't think capitalism itself has broken. I think people refuse to enforce capitalism and the rules of capitalism. I'll give you an example. One of the major defects is that people who are very wealthy um, have not been paying the right amount of taxes. So they've, you know, it's estimated that, estimated that over $5 trillion worth of taxes um, was avoided in the United States by the billionaires. Maybe that is true, but that is not a failure of capitalism. That's a human failure. Somebody did not enforce the rule for that. And how did we get to the point where capital and those who control resources have become, they play such a significant role in determining political outcomes? Because more than 40%, sometimes 50% of people will not vote. If you do not vote, then the candidate that is likely to win will not represent your interest. So that is not a failure of um, democracy. It's a failure of people. Now, the fundamental failure that has driven both the governance issue and the lack of participation, to my mind, is education. Um, until we begin to pay more attention to ensure that every single person has this decent level of education and, and um, I would say, understanding of how resources are allocated, then we'll have a problem. If you look at the forces that have led to the rise of populism, is generally people who are not well educated, people who do not understand the implication of their actions. And people that are paying a really high price for globalization, who don't have health care, whose children you know, go to school hungry, who generally are looking around, and while it seems the world is you know, running and leaving them behind, essentially. Correct. Correct. And the reason we got to that point was that their interests were not being protected within the democracy. And the reason their interests were not being protected was that they've not organized and participated to make sure that they were considered. So it's simply a question of you choose a system, the rules are clear, we need to make sure people participate in the system, otherwise it will break down. The other point is that there is no clarity, there's no certainty that there's an alternative model today to deliver the kind of um, growth and productivity that we have seen. So even though inequality has reached a certain level, the reality is that the quality of life for most people in the last 50 years under the system has improved significantly. In fact, never in the history of humanity have people lived that quality. Have you had so many people outside poverty? Fixing the issues, um, I think this is down to do you want to throw away the baby with the bathwater? I don't think that the market system is this. It's, it is clear that it creates a lot of economic value. Even the countries that are not capitalist in the outlook, like China, they're dependent almost entirely on the market system to drive resource allocation. Because even though they have some level of central allocation of resources for production, when it comes to distribution and market, it, it is actually driven by the individuals and their preferences. So we need to take what is good about this system 
And the part of the system that is broken is not the market system, it is the governance. At a point we used to bear, at a point we used to cry, but now we are not doing either, we are standing our feet because it is our fundamental human right. We have the right to speak. Let your voice not be silenced. I have willingly come to a protest where there's very little social distancing and very few masks. And the reason is this. Young Nigerians are fighting against a pandemic that is taking their lives. A pandemic that seems to be much worse than COVID. Police brutality. Across the country, young people are taking to the streets, protesting the fact that an anti-robbery squad, which was set up to tackle armed robbers, has essentially become something that is being used to rob young people. And they've had enough. They're saying enough is enough. They want to take this country back because as far as they're concerned, this pandemic is much bigger than COVID. And so they're out on the street, risking their lives, knowing that it is possible they get infected, but they're willing to do it because they're saying something has to be done. From health to education, to our economy, all the way to subnational and federal governance. Amidst all this, one word kept popping into my head, trust. We don't trust our government. The government doesn't trust us. We don't trust them, you know. They lie to us every day. They care about their pockets, care about their power. They, they want to perpetuate themselves in office. It's not about the people. Uh, COVID will define good leadership. And um, the storm has only just started in terms of the socio-economic impact. If anything, what COVID has done is to unmask the truth and remind us that challenges often happen when we least expect, and that the big test of our nationhood is likely to come without warning. But if we prepare now, we may not end up a casualty of the times or be forced to say a tearful farewell to our loved ones or our nation.
thank you very much. That was uh, a must. I think the film deserves a bigger round of applause. Yeah, very well. okay. I can tell you confidently that this film, or confidentially, that this film is over three hours. That we reduced to this just for this effect and uh, been shown on channel television uh, throughout April, every Thursday in April. Coming, Adia Alima Camilo. Thank you for joining. How do you go? Thank you for being here. Isa, Isa. Thank you for multi choice. Thank you for coming. Uh, and especially, I'd like to special. Uh, Acknowledge our brother, our friend. In fact, the one we say is only the field pole in the, in the north, not here, but we know of the work he does. He's actually very much wanted in Lagos, but he's always escaped. He comes in and he runs back, and nobody knows where. He has to tell me how he does it. Abu Karim Mohammed, Chairman, Board of Trustees, Motion Picture Partners, and Please stand up to the record. You've done the work. He's also the MGC CEO of Movie Limited. Thank you very much, A strong link between healthcare and economic growth, as evidenced by the impact of the COVID 19 pandemic on Nigeria and indeed the world. In order to prevent future health crises, I will have to build over the effect on our economy, work to improve access to healthcare, support research and development in the health sector, and find ways to disseminate useful information on healthcare to the general public. On our part, the CBN remains committed to working with all stakeholders in improving access to finance and credit that will support the development of a viable healthcare infrastructure in our country. The CBN therefore commends the extensive work that has been undertaken by the producers of the film, Ms. Adaria Ahmed and Mr. Femi Rubin, in showcasing attention on a very vital aspect that is required for the progress of Femi society, which is the development of a robust healthcare system that can cater to all Nigeria, the government, the Governor Central Bank of Nigeria. Thank you very much. And now we are here for the, uh, the conversation that we're about to have. and she's the co-producer and presenter of... No, she graduated from Master Department. So, a very big uh, applause. Second round of applause. You this is a showcase of what this community is talking about. I remember the director of uh, BUKFF telling me that uh, this school is maintaining the same tradition that I started with and that it's not going to give up. WTVC, thank you very much for the work that you are doing. So, I'd like to bring Can you bring the other microphone? So, I'd like to bring here, let me start with uh, Dr. Aisha Farouk, Reproductive Health Coordinator, Cardo State. Thank you. 
That's Dr. Aisha Farouk, Professor Issa Sadiq Bubaka, Director of CID and And uh, Dr. Tijani Uzin, the Deputy Secretary, Primary Healthcare Management Board Council, the very powerful cabinet of PAN. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaman, for that introduction. I'm not going to waste a lot of time because I know it's almost time for Zoom prayers. And I want to make this a quick, sharp, but um, hopefully very informative conversation. I'll probably ask three or four questions, and then I'll get people from the audience who want to engage to do the same. So can I please ask that we also get a mic ready for the end? And if I could um, start with um, Dr. Zidane Hussein. Why does primary health care matter? Primary health care matters because that is the beginning of health care. Uh, primary health care, if I am to take us back, started long before Almata. For those who are in medicine, for example, you must have heard of Almata. Uh, it started when... Could you move your mind because of the mask? You are a bit more... Uh, it started just as... Perhaps an individual with an ailment coming to see a health worker to get remedy. And then after Alma Atta, it became the center of providing health care. And especially the uh, universal health coverage. And it is built upon five principles on equity, equitable distribution, on community involvement, on its main focus is prevention, and then appropriate technology. I cannot bring what is it say the developed world to a third world. And then it has to be multi sectoral. Therefore, it is a vehicle to provide health care to each and every citizen of the country. If, if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is primary health care structurally is designed to reach each and every corner, as opposed to say secondary health care or tertiary health care. Precisely. And therefore, it's sort of the first line of um, providing health care for everybody, everybody, in a sort of equitable way. Yes. Okay, let me bring forth in here. What are the challenges to doing that in a place like Kano and then within the wider Nigeria context? Thank you very much, Edithia. Um It's a pleasure answering questions from you, just like uh, the president of the country did sometimes back. Um, there are many challenges facing primary health care implementation in Nigeria and we can look at this when we take them in different blocks or clusters. We can look at the government itself, government related factors. We can look at the population or community related factors and then uh, we look at uh, the health services related factors itself. From the part of the government, we have seen even in this film and in other spheres that there is lack of political commitment cutting across the three levels of government, but it is more seen at the lower level. Because primary health care is supposed to be run by the local governments because they are the closest to the grassroots. And unfortunately, most of our leaders, especially at the LGA level, have very poor commitment to the implementation of uh, primary health care and it is the result of most of the things we are seeing. Secondly, lack of adequate financing. Uh, across board, uh, we know that we have a lot of financial challenges, but even the much we have, lack of prioritizing what we spend on creates most of our problems. So we find out that we have so many non-functional facilities because they are starved of the resources they need in terms of money, 
in terms of material and human resources. We have very inadequate uh, number of staff that are working in the primary health care facilities. And even those that are working, they are poorly motivated, they are poorly remunerated, and they have uh, decayed knowledge because they have not been upgrading their knowledge and so uh, they are not performing the functions they are uh, supposed to be performing. You find a situation where, for example, a radiographer or an X-ray technician is providing health services when these things are supposed to be uh, provided by better experts. So we, and we have a frontline person, and I'm coming to you still, um, Dr. Farouk, but I want to go back to the executive secretary because in many ways, he is directly in charge of providing health care. The assessment by the court, does that tally with your experience? And how much responsibility do you, as someone working and charged with the responsibility of providing health care, how much responsibility do you take for the failures that you see? <laughs> um, sincerely, uh, I think we are not meeting that aspiration. I'll give you an example. And I'll be pro so that I'm not too specific. Uh, in 2018, the WHO, that is the World Health Organization, ranked Nigeria as a country at 187, position 187 out of 190 For what? On health, the health system mm -hmm. generally. And this is largely driven by primary health care. So I'm, I'm being brought so that it's not only specific to Calabria. And this ranking, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Democratic Republic of Congo, these are war rubbish countries, actually outperform Nigeria. Actually, and an assessment was conducted out of the over 30,000 primary health facilities across Nigeria, less than 20% of them provide the needed services we provide. So, if I were to extrapolate and look at what we provide, this answers your question. Do we? Well, not to the extent we would have. And how do I take responsibility as a government, as a stakeholder, as an important player within our primary health care? I would say 50% of it is ours. Only 15? Yes, I would say 50%. Okay. Right. I would say 50%. But again, it's distributed the remaining parts actually are distributed across and even to the levels that are out of our own control. I'll give an example again. How do communities take charge and ensure that primary health care is being provided in their domains? So that again, some of it goes to the communities. Okay, I mean, I will come back to the issue of how we tackle the issues. I want to bring Dr. Farouk in here now because you work in reproductive health. And often when people think of reproductive health, they think of it as a, a woman in female health, you know, women's health. Forgetting that actually what we're talking about is birthing the generality of the population. And there's been a direct correlation made between the sort of care that babies get from the time they're born to the age of five to their mental development and therefore to how you know useful they become as citizens of society. What for you are you finding to be the biggest challenge to providing the sort of support that you need to provide at the primary health care level? Um, thank you. Um, to start with, I would like to acknowledge that I'm in the midst of my teachers and mentors, so whatever I'll say, they will say it better. Um, when reproductive health is concerned, as you mentioned, is um, beyond just um, the health of a woman, but um, the health of the society as a whole, which is the 
um, approach of primary health care is the <laughs> is society as a whole care. So um, in terms of maternal and child health, I will put it, um, the role of primary health care can never be overemphasized. Um, as my, the EF mentioned, um, primary health care means bringing care to the doors of um, the people, as close as physical. And we all know that Nigeria, that our health industries are very poor, especially in terms of maternal and um, infant mortality. And Kanovin in the Northwest, we record this highest indices, poor indices. So um, the role of primary health care pertaining maternal and child health is very critical, it's very crucial. And, and from the point of view, um, I mean, it's mentioned issues around training, funding. Um, can I ask, in terms of the way we are currently structured, are the structures designed to produce a functional primary health care system, or are there distortions in the way that we are currently structured? And anybody can answer? Yeah, I'll have a go at it. Okay. Um, the way we by law, primary health care is to be provided at the LG level. And before the advent of, say, the primary health care under one roof, it means we have 774 autonomous health authorities that perform functions independently. So imagine that system, mm. chaos, disorganization. And the system is left to people that are not sufficiently skilled. But again, if you look at it from the topmost level down to that level, mm. this has its own issue, the last level, the LGA level, the community level. But again, you see functions of this lower level being usurped by even the national level. In Kano, for example, you now see a primary health care center that is supposed to be equitably distributed per the principle. It's been built, it's been designed in Abuja, it's been constructed in Abuja, and nobody knows of it. And you can see two centers, for example, that lie side by side. The distortion here is there is no proper separation of responsibilities. Okay, so let, let me understand. You're talking about um, the, the secondary and tertiary systems usurping the role for local government. But yeah. did I also hear you suggest that the distribution across 77, um, the 70, 774 local governments is wrong. I, I'm a little bit, because you, when you talk to people like Professor Sadiq, and correct me if I'm wrong, your view is actually that is where it needs to reside. And people need to allow the local governments to take charge fully. Are you disagreeing with that? I'm not disagreeing to that. Okay. And perhaps I... I should have started, I said, when I started, I said, before the primary health care under one roof. Again, from, I was fortunate when you are, when the premier is going on, um, I felt I was reliving the experience because I was also integral part of Kano response. Part of what I've seen over time is coordination amongst multiple stakeholders. So the distribution, seemingly autonomous distribution of these LG, LGAs is there is no cohesion. That brings a problem itself because each is not in synchrony with the other, and with the other, with the other. That is what I meant, not that they are not supposed no. to act. Mm. And I don't mean tertiary institution and secondary institutions or sapping the primary institution. It's not them. 
It's not the secondary facilities, it's not the teaching hospitals, but again, the players that run these systems. So the, 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 the governance structure. The governance structure. Okay, Professor Sadiq, from your point of view, how do we begin to correct those distortions in a way that means we can get health to the most vulnerable people and begin to deal with some of the issues that then become major issues, even including things like nutrition, for example, for babies. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, this is a country where we have a lot of policies, a lot of plans that have been carefully designed, but our problem is lack of implementation. Let me just tell you that in this country, we have witnessed the time when we have developed what we call the National Health Act, which is supposed to be binding on all the stakeholders at the different levels of government, the community, and other parastatals. Everything has been written down uh, with the responsibility of each being specified. And then we have the National Strategic Health Development Plan. We are now experiencing the second batch of it, which is supposed to be implemented between 2018 to 2022. In that plan, we have written almost everything. We have costed all our interventions, not only nutrition, even including emergency preparedness, uh, which is the aspect that handles epidemics like COVID-19. These are things that if we really implement, because everything has been budgeted for to the last COBO, so if we have taken this and ensured that we are implementing with each stakeholder playing their own role and not venturing into the other people's roles, and where there is supposed to be synergy, where, where there is supposed to be like uh, coming together to dialogue and discuss and correct one another, all these things taking place, we shouldn't have any problems. But then implementation of every policy or every plan can in I, Can I ask you something, yes. Professor Sadiq? Often when we talk about health and education, these two things, which in most places are controlled at the local government level, and the fingers seem to be pointing directly at state governments and a failure for them to give complete autonomy, including financial autonomy, to local governments so that they can get the budget that is... Um, at the national level budgeted for local government and other. Is this a, a correct assessment or not of where the major problem lies? Of course, um, you see, let me just be specific on primary health care implementation. When we started in Nigeria, specifically in 1988, with the first national health policy, whose background is actually uh, on the principles of primary health care, the implementation was done by the state. But in 1991, when we felt like one of the major things we were running under PHC, that is immunization program, we have achieved a lot of success. We transferred this responsibility to local government. But the necessary funding to run this was not equally transferred. So the local governments now had some more responsibilities, but no financial backing. Mm -hmm. And with the political dispensation, we all hear about the states holding on to the resources of the local government and just releasing this in piecemeal, except in the case of some few states. But globally, you know that the resources are with the state. While there are a lot of responsibilities, especially in the social sector, like education and health, as you said, that is supposed to be run by the local government. So they need the resources to run this, but they don't have the resources. Let me but ask on the other hand, sorry, a lot of corruption, again, is at the lower level. So it's a very dicey situation. You don't know whether you support the local governments having the resources or because you fear that they may mismanage the resources, you will still want the status quo ante. But then we need to try the other one that is given to the LGS and C with a lot of monitoring. In, in running reproductive health um, and supervising that particular aspect of the work, Dr. Farouk, how, how have you dealt with the challenges of limited resources and then ensuring that the resources that do exist are not either stolen or diverted or wasted? Because you know sometimes it's not just about stealing, sometimes it's about also wasting 
and being misdirected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How have you dealt with those challenges? Um, so um, I'll write on what Prof said. Um, we have beautiful reforms, but the implementation is where the problem is. Um, same with um, reproductive health services. Um, I think the issue of um, limited resources being used and the accountability process is just having your check-ins, having your accountability mechanism in place. Um, for instance, issues of um, reproductive health, I'll give um, an example of the family planning commodities that we have. Um, they are centrally procured, brought to the state, we will take them to the LGE, but it, you will find that they don't reach the facility. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the strategies we do is take them to the last mile, meaning take them up to the facility level. That way, you ensure there is accountability and we can monitor our processes. Okay. Um, I'd like to open the conversation, but before we do, I think I'd like to give His Royal Highness an opportunity, perhaps to say a few words about what we've been discussing, if, um, because, you know, he wasn't here when we first started, when he could have spoken. Okay. أعوذ بالله من هدان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى يقبان حكومة فلا الله فيها متاكم فاركو لجهر كانو متي مكين شو قبان وانا جامعة وانا سكشري وانا تارو and the sky on and we salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu kamari da aka gaya chumi mirtaba sarkin karai do mingi hala chuan dan taro ya turo ni do mo mo kili chishi chiki mo kili chin nasa sana wala wanda sika hili wanda taro do nda sika wanda nguli Yena ugudia Da wana gayada aki masa yuzo wana nguli Kuma yana fatan alheri ga wana ntaru Yena tabata wada wana Wengi ya Wafasa abu uliteki wajani man shawara Kukuma abai shawara Kan haraka kulada lafia Awana njaha tamu Mimaratapa asaliki Yena sana wada Wanda mkwingi ada ala umma tasike wanda nguli Shi haya nda amasara utasa Deha kimai tasike da kasa Desa ti sada eka amasara da rohoto Na COVID-19 A ilin halen tasike chikia agarama hukuma su Ya ati mata kuma zira rafor za akai akai Amala li desa ti se anka ilin halen da eki chiki Akochi masara uta tasike gargahim masara utasa Kalishi Yena ada dafatan alheri Zawanna mkungi ala taha dawanna ntaru La al umma tisika zawanna nguli Badan zawanna ba Sena ba wanna mkungi ya shawara Tamari yedda Saka gaya chimu makadu Aka itanuna mana wanna Maji giku film Na bas shawara Tenda akano aiki Humakano taifu lile roo Taifu lile yung very well Achiki yung haraka ya kwa COVID Ina dekewe na anta shi Nuno ilu ena abu buwa nga nuno Na jahara kano Yungu maa yaka tenda sike Ya ki COVID na akano Da guwa mneti Da te ampani da kudi Da loka chinta Muda miki na kano magani wa namasike Ba yankano wa sige kwa 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 Sani ke bade shawara ina anta hita ro ilu wana indi atahara kanu ni alanka nuna abanda gwa mwete nkano Tayi di mwa akala wa gwa mwete kwa alu nguwa da maa ikata Di mwa sasalali abanda sakai Ana sanadasu Mena adaa Alla kabamu lafia, alla kabamu zama lafia Salamu alaikum
this particular conversation is being streamed live on radio across the country. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to do a quick translation of the message that His Royal Highness sent, which was to basically thank the organizers of this particular program for inviting him and for essentially um, taking the trouble to document the fight with COVID. But at the same time, he also wanted to give us a bit of an update on what is going on in his own district. He said in Karae at the moment, he continues to receive regular reports because he has set up a mechanism where he gets feedback still till today regarding COVID cases and which he uses to pass on that same information to the affected authorities. Going forward, he said he would have liked to see a bit more focus on Kano State because Kano also dealt with COVID and he would have wanted this film to spend a little bit more time looking at the way the Kano State government worked um, to deal with COVID in the country. So my answer to him is maybe we'll do another one. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, His Royal Highness. Now I want to open up uh, the conversation and then I think the final remarks will leave it for our hosts, the um, dean and the professors that we have that are hosting the conversation. But if we could get members of the public to quickly give us maybe three, four comments or questions for the panel and then we wrap it up because we have to go and say the afternoon prayer. Okay, so if I see the people who want to ask questions, yes, sir. And maybe tell us your name because, like I said, this is being streamed live on radio. Everybody's listening. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Abdullah Adamu in the Department of Information and Media Studies. My comment is not about the panelists, but about the film itself. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, Madam uh, Kaderia will be delighted to know that I'm a disruptive person. Uh, disruptive okay. in the sense that I tend to disagree rather than agree with what everybody has said. It seems to me that the film deals basically with f what I would call policy propaganda. Uh, because there is a disconnect between what the panelists are saying and what the film is saying. The film is talking about the wonderful things people have been doing, the, the, what government has been doing, uh, and we have all these uh, big players, and the big players telling us the, the strategies they have taken in order to curtail this disease. But at the same time, we have panelists who are telling us uh, a little bit of a different narrative about the realities of what is on ground. But my, my focus is on the trust aspect, not the leadership aspect. The trust aspect dealing with public culture and the way public culture accepts this health challenge. I have cases of religious leaders inciting their followers about this particular pandemic. And we didn't see that. We didn't see the consequences of somebody going on a falfit and talking to people and telling them that COVID is, is a lie. It, it is not real and it, it happens and based on it, it, based on what their religious leaders tell them that has greater emphasis on their health behavior than on what doctors tell them so I, I would have loved to see some kind of shifting the narrative towards a situation where we see public culture telling us clearly what's going on. I mean, have all these NGOs going about with all these poor kids and so on and so forth. This is beautiful for, for YouTube. I mean, it's wonderful. It shows on YouTube and everybody claps. But I, I would like to see the ghetto, the real ghetto of individuals denying that there is COVID-19. And these individuals are from positions of policy and public responsibility. This is not only in Africa. It happened in the United States. Trump didn't believe in it. And the U.S. is supposed to be the, the leader of the free world. So if something narrative like that could happen in the United States, what about here in Africa? How are we covering it? How are we dealing with it? 
What about the anti-vaxxers? People who come around and say they will not get a vaccine because they don't believe in the disease to begin with. How, how do we deal with that? So I would have loved to see a mask really going deep behind the mask, telling us the good, the bad, and the absolutely ugly. Thank you, pandemic sir. Control. We, thank yeah, you. Let's take another contribution, then we'll come back thank and you. get a response. Yes, thank you. Um, you may have to calm down there, please, because of the, because of the people recording, so they are not traveling. Thank you. Very brief. Uh, my name is Abdul Gafar Oladi Meji from Nigerian Union of Journalists, Kano State Council. My first question, thank you for, I will thank the organizers of this forum. My first question will go to Dr. Seni. Sir, during the pandemic, at the time, there was no flow of, info, of information because you particularly was supposed to be responsible for the provision of information. At that time, journalists were almost becoming frustrated and at a point in time, journalists were even disinforming the people because you were not accessible. I personally had to delete your number because I could not reach you. Sir, this really created an environment where there was a disconnection. So, and now today, from what you have said here, I, I want to, because information is part of the whole thing, what was the problem that made you unaccessible to journalists? Okay, that is thank one. you. And to no. Professor Isa, you're talking about accountability, sir. Mm. Sir, I, I want you to tell us from your, own, from your own experience, when it comes to particular issue of COVID and health issues at the local government level, how can we or how can we, what strategy do you think we can better apply so that we can hold these people more accountable, particularly those that are responsible for these resources at local okay, government we'll level? Okay, we'll take Thank another you. one, maybe from that end of the room. That, yeah, because we've stayed uh, here. Let's go that way. Okay. We have uh, to balance it out. Thank you. I am Mike Adeyi from Federal College of Education, Kano. I thank the organizers and I have just a little question, a very small question. Our health care situation is not what it should be. This has been att attested to by the panelists. We all know the situation and that is why India and Egypt and other countries are reaping bountifully from medical um, tourism from Nigeria. We have designed policies. We have worked out what it should be. But like the professor said, the problem is implementation. What is there about this implementation that we cannot get over? Right from time, this issue of implementation has been there about not only in healthcare uh, industry, but then almost in all facets of Nigerian life. Why can't we get over this implementation problem? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll come back to the panel, get a few comments based on the questions asked, and go back. And I think I will start, if you don't mind, because of the comments he made. I think it's easy to forget when you see a documentary that it was actually shot during a pandemic. And 50, um, hindsight is 50-50 vision. While everybody was in lockdown, we were out on the streets actually talking to people. At that time, one of the reasons why we had to use uh, Fisai or Soyom. So it's easy to sit back and criticize a movie that was shot a year ago and went into post-production. Um, when now we know, you understand what I mean, after the fact. So in many ways, what this documentary set out to do was to document what was going on. 
We were never going to be able to document every single thing. That's the nature of things. But also use it as a conversation starter, which is why everywhere where we've had the premiere, we've actually had a panel of experts sit down and discuss this thing. Um, could we have done other things? Maybe. But um, I think if you talk folding, you know what we know today, and I think you heard one of the professors saying there, we didn't know. Nobody thought, you know, of what was going to happen. So that was just, I wanted to make that comment. And I think there were a few specific questions for the panel as well about not being reached. It was our experience as well. It's not everybody that we set out to talk to that we got to talk to. Yes. Um, uh, my apologies if you tried to reach me and I was unreachable. However, the response is structured this way. There is coordination and then there are pillars including risk communication and social mobilization. Perhaps, perhaps, again, is the heat of the moment. We are in an unprecedented pandemic that people actually never knew what to do. Uh, they are doing it on the go. Perhaps that could have caused that. But again, at that moment, uh, it can only be imagined. It can only be imagined. So if you are unable to reach, then apologies. And those at um, the hem of affairs, just like she rightly mentioned, heat of the moment, people are trying to control a pandemic, accessing people could be challenging. And I had to leave my house, for example, for several days to ensure that I was at the forefront ensuring things are done. Uh, that, can, and that can only be imagined. Can we deal with the last issue that was raised by the last speaker, which is that, can we be kind of honest about why we're not able to implement all these beautiful plans? Yeah. We have a governance issue, don't we? Yes. Really? Yeah. I think we have, I have two issues to respond to. The one, the first is on the local government not being able to be accountable. I think if we apply the principle of mutual accountability, it is there entrenched in our dealings in the health sector. Uh, mutual accountability where each of the players or stakeholders have to be accountable to the other. The local governments can be held responsible for whatever action or inaction they are supposed to do. We have it in our National Health Act. The only thing is people as Nigerians need to be informed about this so that they will know their right. In our National Health Act, we have roles and responsibilities for each arm of government. And if they do not play it right or they refuse to act or they act inappropriately, people can take them to court and they can be liable. It's just that in Nigeria, people are not informed. And it is time that we, including, of course, the journalists, need to come out and talk to the people so that they will know where they can hold the other person responsible. And that's not just the local government, but including the other arms of government and the communities themselves. I think that might have answered your maybe, question. Maybe additionally, then, sorry, prop, if I can. So again, just to ensure that there is that mutual accountability, that is why the primary health care under our roof policy is enacted. Primary health care under our roof uh, tries to do this. Has the primary health care system under one management, one plan, and one M&E, so that you are not dealing with separate individuals. There is that policy, and it has its own pillars that are about nine. Perhaps, again, latching on to his own question, why are these policies not implemented? I'm not too sure I'm competent, maybe Prof. <laughs> okay, uh, let's, well, let's take maybe the last set of questions well, and come back so we wrap it up because I, I want to be closed by two so people can pray. We'll take one, two, three. The lady here, let's start with her. Yes, Zainab Audubago. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'll first of all like to congratulate um, the producers of this Omas 
Leadership Trust on COVID-19. Kadria, you did a wonderful job and I'm very proud of you. Thank you, my dear. Um, secondly, I would like to say and um, go on what you say. Governance is an issue in Nigeria and I think government has misplaced their priorities when it comes to issues of health and education. So my advice, I was the former Commissioner, Ministry of Science and Technology, and we have a lot of untapped, talented young youths, and we have a lot of untapped, talented medical personalities or, or, or youths that we could use. Because I believe in Nigeria, I believe in our youth, I believe in the menta the, 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 um, their, their education and so on and so forth. And I believe in Nigeria we can find the cure. I believe in Nigeria we can find ways of tackling this if we use our youths properly. So it's an advice for people in, in governance to look into these untapped youths and use them. I did that, Ministry of Science and Technology. We have a lot of innovators and inventors, and I brought them out. We did the first exhibition in Kano State, and it was a success. So I think we could do that even with the orthodox um, f um, medical personnel and something can be done about this thing. Now we know with Unmask what you did during the pandemic, and we, now we know the high risk and the detri detrimental um, effects of COVID. So we should start doing something about it now. Set up labs that we don't have, labs that these people can utilize. It's the infrastructure that is missing, not the people that can do it. We have the people that can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, my name is Zainab Audubago, former Ministry of Science and Technology, Kano State. Thank you. There, there are some young people at the back over there. Please, sir, you have to call me, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nura Garwa. Um, I would like to commend you for this uh, documentary. It, uh, was uh, well designed and well captured and of course uh, it reminds up it reminds us of uh, the dark days of uh, uh, COVID-19 lockdown and of course we have seen a lot of uh, work you have done it's quite marvelous uh, from the documentary um, there was a remark credited to the governor of uh, Kaduna State Nasser RFI and that is a question uh, to the Director Center for Infectious Disease Research. He said um, private uh, hospitals or infirmary are not good in tackling infectious diseases. And of course, from what we've seen, the private institutions have the best facilities, equipment, the uh, best hands from what, we've, uh, what we see. So how can you please appreciate of um, what Nasri Erofai said? That okay. Thank yeah, you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I think there's a, yeah. And then down there, and then we wrap it up. Good evening, sir. And good evening, ma. My question goes to you, Prof, sir. The main problem of health care, especially the primary health care in Nigeria, is public enlightenment. You will see there is a situation whereby the people living in a rural area are not being enlightened by a certain disease and a certain um, uh, what do we call it? by a certain diseases. Sir, what do you do to enlighten those people living in a rural area about the COVID-19 and the uh, care how to how to manage the diseases? Thank you. German, there's a few people. My name is Said Atiku Said. Okay. We, this, there are three gentlemen in the middle. Okay. And then we go there and we wrap it up. Please, we're having an issue with the... Yeah. Yes. Thank you for recognizing me. Mukhtar Magaj is my name. I am with the Department of Information and Media Studies. I would love to focus on the governance side. And I think from what we have seen from the documentary screen and from what the panel uh, have focused on, they are more into governance based on structure and resources. And I think when we are talking about pandemic, 
the bottom line is about anxiety and fear. Anxiety and fear on the part of people affected. And what will address anxiety and fear? Communication. I sympathize with the journalist who could not get access to an official who's supposed to be maybe dishing out information. But I think we shall go beyond that. It is about addressing concerns. At the time of the pandemic, there were fears. Fears of losing life. Fears of losing livelihood. Fears of losing our social freedoms. Fear, 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 even fear of the unknown. What was the component, the communication component, and how did we govern it? So okay. I think the focus should be communication. And, communication. and that's the bottom line of the documentary itself. If I may comment a little bit about the commentary itself. Okay, but we need to be yeah, quick. Yeah, exactly. A very quick one. Mm. I, I think it will, uh, like uh, His Royal Highness uh, observed, uh, it will be good if this will go across the country for the documentary, the content, to be a bit representative. We know you can't capture all the, the whole reality, but do as much as possible to capture substantive part of the reality. I can see most of the shootings were done either between Lagos, Abuja, and at most Kaduna. It was I places, don't know. It's places we could get to during lockdown. Okay. <laughs> I so, don't think you guys so understand. I, I, there were no what planes. I'm trying to advise is maybe <laughs> next time, in the next production, or if you are improving on this, try yeah. to be a little more representative. Please. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. good afternoon. My name is Abdul Karim Mohammed, and I would like to comment first on the documentary film. I would like to say that uh, it is quite heartwarming to see the efforts that were made to produce it, and it's highly commendable. Secondly, I would recommend that since you are moving it around campuses, you should reduce the timing of the firm is too long for such an exercise. I think we get more value of the discussion if you can enlarge the time of the discussion points because what the documentary is trying to do is to raise issues for discourse. And if you localize the discussions to come up with suggestions <laughs> that will prop up from the professionals that you are assembling, it will go a long while in enriching the conversation. Secondly, I would like to say that uh, as far as COVID is concerned, it has brought new normal. So what will be the take home of our new normal based on the knowledge and the experience we have gathered from people like you? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. And the final comment. Oh, OK. Can you come down? Just come here. Uh, mine is going to be a very short uh, comment. Um, considering the fact that the local government is the environment where the primary health care is being implemented and uh, one of the panelists told us the local government is, uh, has enormous job or enormous responsibilities with little capability. Now is it possible, is it possible to seek for fiscal autonomy, fiscal independence of the primary health care in Nigeria. Thank you, sir. And that's the final comment. My name is Fanen Hyongo from the Nation newspaper. I also want to commend the people behind this documentary. Uh, my question was half asked by somebody let me ride on it the take home from this place should answer certain questions questions like is covid real we watch from the documentary where leaders were given the opportunity to talk on what they know on what they were able to do to prevent spread. Did they mislead us? The take home should answer some of these questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Okay, let's come back to the, and let them please, in answering your questions, you also wrap it up with your final remarks, because from here we're handing back to the deputy VC to sort of wrap up the whole event, yes? So maybe if we start with Prof, then go to Dr. Farouk and end with the ES. Would that work? Do you have a microphone there or should I give you one? Ah. Okay. Um, okay, thank you very much uh, for all your comments and questions. They have enriched uh, our sitting here. The first one is an unfinished business having to do with problem of implementation. I think it has to do with our mindset as Nigerians. Many of us either do not believe in the country or we do not believe in the systems we are working under. It is easier for us to just give up than to play our own part so that hoping that other people will also do their own and then mobilize one another towards achieving a common goal. And that is what will push us to achieving what supposed to achieve. I think that is uh, that answers that. Then the second question has to do with uh, what uh, Governor El Rufai said that uh, private institutions are not well conversant with handling infectious diseases. That is very clear. This is because the private sector is profit oriented. So as the owner of a private hospital, you are looking for diseases that people will come, occupy your bed for a few days, and then you gain as much as you can, and then they off, they are gone, and then you make your profit out of their stay. But you find out that in most chronic infectious diseases, for example, tuberculosis, it is even free, because the national uh, program treats people free of charge, so you don't get paid for anything. So they do not pay much attention in terms of building their capacity, manpower and resources to handle that. But the government which handles the public sector invests a lot in that. For example, you have seen the new center that they were developing in Kaduna. I was there. I've seen it. It looks very beautiful. And I know how much they invested in it. I know the amount of resources, trainings they have done. Similarly, if you look at Kano and every other state, we saw what the states have done. And then even before that, we know that all these infectious diseases are being handled by the government and a lot of trainings. Because if you look at the ne person sitting next to me, uh, Dr. Aisha Farouk was our student. She's a product of Bayer University. And we, she was sent to Abuja to undergo a course called Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Training Program. It is governments that send their staff to undergo this training. This is the training that gives them hands-on. Uh, their capacity is being built on how to handle epidemics, surveillance, and a lot of things. So they are well conversant with that, and we have them across board. ABU and Ibadan are doing that. Then the issue of enlightenment this is a role for all of us, not only those of us in the health sector, the information sector led by National Orientation Agency, and all of you have a hand in this. And we have to ensure that we continue Dr. to Tan. do it. Mm. Then the last one, the new normal and take home. Take home messages from this uh, sitting is that we have just uh, witnessed one epidemic that is COVID-19. Many more epidemics are coming, either from the same virus, because we are now seeing the one coming, the variant from India, Brazil, and Turkey. It may come to us. It may not. We are not praying that it should come. Another virus or another organism may rear its head in form of another epidemic. So we should not sit and wait for it to come. We have to always be prepared. Governments, workers in the health sector, information, everybody, the traditional institution, oh. even the academia, everybody has to be prepared for the next epidemic and we have to take the measures. Thank, we have thank, to practice thank you before very it much, comes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Dr. Farouk? Yes, uh, I would like to make it very short and close on what Prof said. Um, from the documentary, we've seen that 
um, COVID has exposed our weaknesses, especially in the health sector. But on the other hand, it has provided opportunities for us to have a more resilient system in the future. So it's how we invest in that opportunities that matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mine, I think, is about uh, fiscal independence for, for primary health care. Um, I alluded briefly um, about the primary health care under our roof policy. Uh, that policy um, outlines what needs to be done in primary health care to make it functional. Uh, and it has nine pillars. One of the pillars is actually funding sources and structure. It outlines the primary health care getting its own resources to run its own activities. And that is only one component. The other eight components are governance and leadership, legislation, um, minimum service package, repositioning, uh, guidelines, human resources, and setup. So uh, actually that policy uh, does justice to primary health care system in the country and how it, sh it should be made effective. One thing that we need to do, all of us, not only us within government, is how do we galvanize the, that critical mass that can push all the levels to ensure that they, they have done what they need to do, to ensure that this policy is implemented and is implemented to the latter for the benefit of the people. Okay. And my last comment. Uh, pandemic, just uh, like my co-panelist mentioned, has exposed the country. Our backside is terribly exposed. We need to continue to build on what we have done in COVID, ensure that we improve on our epidemic preparedness, our response, ensure that we placed the right resources in the right places, otherwise we'll be exposed more and more. And I would like, again, I'm in, within the primary system, those who have not taken COVID vaccine should do so. Thank it's you. still available. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. 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 Thank for coming out and helping me put this together. I am very, very grateful for that support. Thank you very much. Okay. I thought, I thought Germany yeah. was Oh, okay, okay. So I didn't get my briefing right. <laughs> We'd like to invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Sagir Adamo Abbas, ably represented by the DVC, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Development, Professor Abdullah Sule Kano. Thank you, sir. We have not only flattened the thing, we have buried the truth in the Majority of them don't really care about the people. Majority of them care about their pockets, care about their power, they, they want to perpetrate themselves in office. It's not about the people. Uh, COVID will define good leadership. And um, the storm has only just started in terms of the socio-economic impact. Come here, various professions. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, let me begin by expressing the deep appreciation of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Segur Adama Abbas, for getting the, giving this university the opportunity to host this show. It is a sincere effort to remember, you know, a history in the production of a new school of thought of youth in the mass communication in a holistic manner. And I believe students that are inclined towards investigative journalism will have a lot to learn from this piece. The technique, the courage, and indeed the sincerity, you know, in the form of questions posed in trying to explore the real subject matter at the most critical time that Nigerians need information. Personally, 
I would say this is an excellent production, and I thank Kaduria and her team. It is a great contribution, really, in the development of uh, this kind of production in this country, that is documentary presentation. There are two most important take-home things that I have from this production. The one, really, is the argument that raised on the political economy of Nigeria. The question that, raised, that was raised as to whether under the existing politics and economy of this country, Nigeria is in a position to handle such a pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, the person present, you know, that this question was presented to evade the second part of the question. Have I recognized the challenge but evade to provide the actual answer that put in question our politics and our economy. The fact is that our new normal will not be different from the imagination of where we are right now until we challenge the politics and the economy of this country. And this is exactly the fundamental crisis of the United States and other advanced capitalist countries at this moment. The fact is that the politics we are doing is not the same politics that Nigeria actually started with. And more importantly is the fact that Nigerians have been convinced that they are in the path of democracy. Where in actual part, as students of political science will analyze, we are moving far away from democracy. This is the contradictory path that the nation is going, and a very painful path. And the second lacuna actually is in the economy. Nigerians are meant to believe that this free market will provide solution to our problem. The fact is that Nigerians don't understand what free market is. And the managers of free market in Nigeria don't even understand what it means. Free market is a philosophic abstraction that covers the atrocities of capitalism as a mode of production. And until our leaders, our rulers, understand what economy they are managing, capitalist economy, sincerely, they can manage it well. And the fact is that, as it relates to the health of Nigerian people, the consequences of this is that the humanity in the study of medicine and health system is increasingly diminishing in the Nigerian system. A situation under which our health institutions supposed to treat people humane is increasingly diminishing. It is in this system today we find that somebody will be crashed in an accident, will be taken to a hospital, and he will be rejected by medical personnel. What kind of medicine is that? It is in this system we see a pregnant woman in a very serious crisis about to deliver will be taken to a public hospital and the doctors will not attend to her because her husband does not have enough money to deposit for her to be treated. This does not happen in any part of the civilized world. Our medical professionals really have to confront these realities. Our government have to confront these realities. Capitalism cannot address these issues of humanity. The system we inherit in Africa the system we inherit, even in the First Republic of Nigeria, medicine is more humane. Medicine is more humane than what we are confronting today. Some of us came from the village. The local government, which is then NA, was administering resources for community system better than what we are having today. And it's a system in which the Hakimi, you know, who is in charge of the district, ensures that even at the primary school level, we have a library to visit. After school, you go to a public library. I still remember the public library I, t I used to attend in Dwarkin Tofa, you know, which now has been turned into a police station. What kind of system is that? The system actually is, this capitalist system is not taking us anywhere. Let's face it. And the fundamental thing is that for those who are students of political economy, they should know. There is no one type of capitalism in the world. There are at least five variants. 
the most terrible capitalism in the world is the Anglo-Saxon capitalism. And it's long practiced in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in New Zealand, and so on. In Anglo-Saxon capitalism, there is no limit to the accumulation of a capitalist. And this is a country that they pride themselves of billionaires. Billionaires that can accumulate as much money as possible. But we have social capitalism practiced elsewhere in the world. If you take the German or the Central European, you know, Scandinavian type, it's a social capitalism under which the society has never been led just for free riders, you know, to keep on accumulating to their money reach to the skies. I'm not sure any of you have ever heard of a German rich man saying that he's a billionaire. Isn't that they don't have very rich people in Germany? But by nature of that capitalism, your wealth to certain limits have to stop at that point. Whatever you earn over and above that will go to the development of the community to ensure education, health, better life for everybody, and good harmonious relationship between those who are at the top and also those who are at the bottom. And even among the third world, we see variants that have worked. Malaysia practiced state capitalism. In Malaysia, the price of any food, any food part or whatever food you take across the country is the same. No one money bar will sit down in one corner and give you a different price that will put people to under a condition of hunger. And of course, you have the oligarchy capitalism practiced by the Arabs and so on. So, but our leaders in Nigeria don't understand this. They think that they are running a capitalism that everybody will have it when rich people have enough money to put in schools, to put in hospitals, to put everywhere, where we know that they will never do that. What they want at any point in time, those who are accumulating in Nigeria, is to take as much as they can and keep on accumulating without even bothering the consequences of what will happen. And these contradictions is what we are seeing in the manifestation of NSAS, in the pockets of the Boko Haram, the Mossop, and all this. It's just manifestation of inequality and, of course, distrust in the state. And, of course, people feel that they will start finding their own way to fight for their survival. So I thank this team. For me, really, this is an excellent presentation, and I wish many Nigerians would see it. And the fundamental questions raised in it, our rulers will make effort to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. There's only one thing to do, uh, photo ops, because our royal father will be joining us. Uh, I think we should come yeah. downstairs. Okay. So, yeah. But while we're doing that, I'd like to specially recognize the presence of uh, Professor M. Kabir, Provost of uh, Yusuf Maitama University, <laughs> College of Medicine. Thank you, sir. If I remember very well, former commissioner in this state. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. We we'll take it in two. Uh, the speakers with the uh, with his royal highness, Femi Udubemi, please. And then later we we'll now take with the. Okay, you will come now. Okay, you want to take this one first. Okay. Okay, second one, yes. Which is Royal Highness. And I think Prof can join. Yes. Prof, yes. Okay. Yes. 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 You can come, sir. Should I join? Yes. Happy career. Yes. Hold on, Akin. Uh, I think I'm, you should be able to. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. I've been told to specially recognize uh, Dr. Tijani because he got, the, he got the invitation only yesterday or so, and you are here. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs>
for being here. I want to thank the crew of the film, Wale and everybody who took part in the film, in the production, and in setting up this uh, conversation, including Khadija. Thank you very much. We want to thank the students. Uh, my regret only for the conversation is that no students seem to have asked, asked a question. So I'm sure you have so many questions that I was not able to. So we want to thank everybody, all the students of this uh, department, the HOD. Thank you very much uh, for helping us to put this together. His Royal Highness and all the guests, all the speakers, everybody who has turned up today. Thank you very much. All the media people, thank you very much. We can't thank you enough. And the technical officers for this um, hall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.